Welcome to the Parasite Podcast, a show about me and you. We are Venom. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Parasite Podcast. And today I have a friend of ours that uh, actually has been on the show before, but on the main Venom Vlog show. And we did an episode together recently that actually got the attention of Donnie Cates. But I guess we didn't hold his attention because unfortunately he has to reschedule with us. And so we don't know when we're going to do uh, that interview at any point, anytime soon. So uh, we'll try to get it to you guys as soon as we can, as soon as we hear from Donnie. Uh, but that is my friend Eddie's mullet. So Eddie, say hello to everybody. What's up? <laughs> and Eddie, you can find a lot in my comment section um, on these videos, and I think has a, a Twitter account, although I'm kind of bummed because now that you're getting a Twitter account, I think I'm going to be deleting social media soon. Um, so I'm like, oh, man, like uh, uh, this one less way to talk to you, unfortunately. Yeah, I just creep on there anyhow, or lurk. <laughs> lurk, I don't creep, I lurk. <laughs> um <laughs> And it doesn't matter, too, because, like, you are actually one of very few people. I do not like to give two things out ever, and it's only because at one point in my life I had a stalker. Uh, so I never give out my phone number or my address. Now, you don't have my address, but you do have my phone number. Um, and so luckily you can always reach me that way, which I usually tell people if they have my number, you know, write me a message on social media first or send me an email first because if you text me while I'm recording a live episode, it, you know, as you'll hear in some of these episodes, some of you guys will hear a beep when I'm recording with people. That's because someone's like my mom or someone is texting me. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty choosy with that. But, uh, but you always seem like a nice guy, and you're very respectful to people in the chat. And that's kind of how we met, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just getting uh, following you. I found you. Like, jeez, ah, I don't even know. Uh, it, was, it was, it was near the movie around when the movie started. But yeah, I just remember seeing that you had a handful of videos, and I was just like, how have I never heard of these before? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think when I ran into Tom Hardy on the set of Venom 2 and, and that picture of with me and him and that video kind of went semi-viral, um, there, it, we picked up a lot of subscribers from that. And it was funny because a lot of them were like, 500 episodes? How come I've never heard of you? <laughs> and I'm just like, ah, because I, I don't make, I guess I don't make a lot of noise. Um, I actually have a video that's gone kind of viral. It's, uh, it's me talking about the bootlace worm. Um, the, uh, the the real life symbiote thing, and yeah. that thing has like like twenty five thousand views, um, and I'm like, what the hell? Like, where where did that come from? Someone must have threw it on Reddit or something. But my favorite thing is, is that it has om almost as many dislikes as it has likes. <laughs> and yeah, I'm like, that, I'm like, that was do, bizarre. I know. I'm like, do do people just not like my? presentation of the video do they rather me not talk about it and just show the clip of the footage or like what, what are they what are they downvoting and it's just but it's just funny because i'm like i'm like well at least it's getting attention yeah that's right yeah there's no such thing as bad publicity right <laughs> i guess not i mean yes there is nowadays but <laughs> um but eddie uh so you know you've like i like i said you've been popping up in the comment section and that's kind of how we started to meet and then you and i started to collaborate outside of youtube like you know in dms and stuff uh, but, you know until i reached a point where i i passed you my number because i knew eventually one day we would make the videos that we did and so from your perspective how you know how did that kind of come about for you like you know because obviously people know my my side of it which is like oh yeah you talked to me in the comments and and then i just you know was like should we do it but uh but i'd love to know what kind of kept you going because we started that like a year and a half ago the idea of it and like and we never gave up on the idea and so i'm kind of curious your point of view on that yeah uh i mean yeah i never never plan on <laughs> never planned on like talking the outside of it it just i guess it just sort of happened organically uh, i remember when we first started talking is we both played uh marvel future fight and and i said that i'd help you out with, with some of that that's when that's when we started um like texting and whatnot outside of outside of uh youtube but i mean yeah just following along and you're talking about stuff i want to talk about and <laughs> there's not a lot of people in my personal life that talk about comics all the time or want to be bothered to hear about venom or marvel 24 7 so <laughs> I guess you fill that you fill that void. <laughs> yeah, there's like there's a little hole in my heart. Oh, this guy will be just fine. <laughs> you know, it's it's funny too because we yeah you're right we did talk a lot about Future Fight, which was a game I was really addicted to, and actually one of the guys behind making the game, uh, Bill Rosenbaum, Rosenbaum, Berm, uh, 
I'm wow. I'm, I can't believe I'm Bill looking. Roseman. Bill Roseman. Yeah, I'm sorry. Over at Marvel, uh, Marvel yeah. Games. Um, his uh, his wife and kid used to come into the Lego store all the time uh, that I work, ah. that I worked at, and so I kind of became friends with them. And then Bill started following me on Twitter, and I kind of at that point I was already hooked on the game. And I remember when the last time she came in, I told her I was like, "Yeah, I'm going to be moving, you know, from California," and she was like, "Oh, but you know, that's good. Health first, you know, and, and that kind of thing." She's a really nice lady, and his kid was awesome. His kid's name is uh, well, I don't I don't want to give away their information, um, but it's a comic book reference. His kid's name, uh, so oh, nice. yeah, he's really really cool people. And uh, I was like, "Oh yeah, I think I've spent like like three hundred and fifty dollars on that game," and she was like what yeah <laughs> and i'm like yeah yeah i i unfortunately i have one of those personalities that when i just am enjoying it a dollar here a dollar there it doesn't matter to me and then i noticed after like a year of playing it i'm like holy crap i've been sinking like 20 to 25 bucks a month on this game um yeah and yeah it, it, it is it, the mobile games man they're a money pit they, they just feed <laughs> they feed <laughs> off of uh addictive you know traits or whatever it, it, they're yeah, I, I really pulled back on it too, just because the the game itself has been going downhill. It should real, it's become real pay to play, and it's not fun. They're not they're not improving anything. They're just throwing more, you know, more lipstick on the pig. <laughs> right. Yeah. And yeah, and I could I just couldn't deal with it anymore. So I, after you gave me some really sound advice, some of it I tried to listen to, some of it I was just like, you know what. I got to get rid of this game because it's uh, it's like when I when I move I cannot be sitting in Florida just dropping money on this game like with all this free time I'm gonna have so I right before I left like the day before I deleted it and, I, and then I think it was like a right when I landed here you were like hey here's some information about Future Fight they're doing some updates and I'm like I deleted it dude like yeah, I I, pu- I pulled the I pulled the bandaid right off yeah good on you yeah um. Yeah, but after a year of bad on me. Uh, so, so, but you are, you you know, you're a big Marvel fan. You talk about Venom. You talk about other Marvel characters. So I'm kind of curious, around what age did you get into, because I ask everybody this. I'm always curious to hear people's origin stories. Like, what age did you get into comics, and kind of who were your early firsts, and who are some of your current, or early favorites, and some of your current favorites? Yeah, when I was real little, uh, shoot, I was thinking... The, the first in comic I remember like image seeing my dad used to take me to the comic shop when I was a kid I'd, uh, I'd see him every other weekend and he'd always take me over there he's he's a big Silver Surfer fan and he'd take me to the comic shop and I remember seeing that uh, the amazing 316 and like looking at you know Spider-Man all beat up by him like, just being like what was that and uh, <laughs> and I'm I remember I picked that thing up and uh, I've been I've been hooked on Venom ever since Nice. And was it? Is it just been Venom, or are there other Marvel characters that you kind of have an interest in? Uh, I love well Spider Man too. Yeah, you know the, the typical. And I and I like I like all those you know the '90s characters. You know <laughs> the goods and the bads. But yeah, are you, you know, a like Night the, Thrasher I like fan? The Warriors runs. The yeah. Predator? I was just going to ask if you were a Night Thrasher fan. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, I got I got his first appearance that that Thor book and nice. and. Yeah, I got yeah quite a few of his issues, but yeah, Venom, Venom. I don't know for some reason Venom stuck out to me as like he was just cool. <laughs> Be it you know it was Todd's art and then uh, and then Bagley. I don't. I wasn't collecting along like I'm like purchasing like a subscription to get into Larson's run. But okay. yeah, I remember most of the stuff that I remember as a kid is Bagley stuff though. Being real, that that's like my Venom, the, the Bagley era. I think his 90s Venom is like the perfect <laughs> look. You know, you know I, one thing I'm a big uh, observer of is, is kind of patterns and waves. I try to be at least. And uh, and what I notice about, like, let's say Resident Evil real quick, like, I, I break Resident Evil up into three generations. Usually I meet people who say Resident Evil 1, 2, or 3 is their favorite, so I call that Generation 1. Um, anyone who says Resident Evil 4 is their favorite, to me, is Generation 2. And then anyone who says Resident Evil 7 is their favorite, um, which I've actually heard a lot of that uh, over the past two years, uh, they, they're Generation 3 to me. So same with comic books. What's what's neat about Venom is that I'll meet Generation 1 Venom fans who came in, um, even some of them pre-Venom, which is the black costume, but usually uh-huh. it's that Todd McFarlane era and then you know some of the Larson and Bagley stuff. But then I would say Generation 2 is probably when the uh, miniseries started. And so yeah. I'll meet a lot of Lethal Protector fans. But what's so funny about that, much like Resident Evil Generation 2, 
I don't meet a lot of people. I certainly meet people, but not a, not in um, in masses of people who say they're fans of Resident Evil Five or Six the most. Um, and same with Venom. After Lethal Protector, there's a, a you know occasionally a separation anxiety or you know or one of those um, or the madness or not even the madness. I think Enemy Within, um, but or Funeral Pyre. But like recently, I just read all the the Larry Hama stuff. I don't think I've run into one person <laughs> that has told me in the comments that any of the Larry Hama stuff is their favorite Venom story. Yeah. Well, you know why? I, I think I know why with those. Is those books were pure eye candy. And, you know, and <laughs> you should know that as <laughs> from, from reviewing them and, and just some of the, you know, the 90s campiness, I guess. It was like, yeah, it's like shotgun content. They were just blasting those Venom minis out, like, nonstop. And, they, you know, it, like, the art's great. The you know even the, the same Keith Wonky stuff from the Marvel Comics presents is it's got its own look. But I mean that yeah those that whole era is just looks. I like I remember going through almost all those books, but not really picking up on the content because I was a kid. You know I just wanted I wanted to see I just wanted to see it, like because yeah, Venom is you know visually appealing. <laughs> that to me that that's but that's initially what you know got me in because I wasn't I think I was like five when. Uh, like 316 and 317 were on the were on the shelf so I think it was 80 89 yeah somewhere in there 88 89 yeah um you know it's funny it's funny about that because when I worked at a comic book store I remember early on the early days of this show I would tell people oh yeah like kids like Venom and, and I would hear teenagers and adults tell me no they don't and I'm like no yes they do and they're like no he's he's scary to kids I'm like He's not though. <laughs> like, no. like the, occasionally, and you, I've had Jacob on the show before, and a couple other people who have said when they were kids and their first look at Venom, they had a visceral negative reaction to his look, and that's since still carries with them as adults too. So, sure, there are kids out there who are afraid of Venom. I'm not saying they don't exist, but in my experience, at least working in comic shops and then just being knee deep in this character, uh, usually kids have a very um, uh, intrigued reaction to him he's he uh, you know i talked about especially from other cultures i talk a lot about how spider-man and venom are, and deadpool and stuff why these characters are so popular and and outside of the u.s too and it's because a lot of cultures have this thing where in animation or in characters or design uh big eyes is seen as a friendly thing and so even though venom has these giant eyes and the, but this big mouth full of teeth and the tongue coming out the kids are kind of they're kind of locked in on the eyes and then also his design is very simple like you get what he is instantly you can ease you look at him and go he's evil spider-man you know i mean obviously that's not the character there eddie's more than that but i'm just saying from an understanding point so you saying at five years old you had that reaction is awesome because i i think most people who are exposed to comics at that age and see characters like venom have the reaction you have yeah, yeah, he's he's clean, and you know, going back to that whole Gen two thing, you're, you're absolutely right because the Gen one people that I know, they all don't like Venom as an anti hero. They all want, they all like he should be Spider Man villain. <laughs> that, that's when he's the best. And like that, my comic shop guy, Ed, he he's always telling me he's, he's like he should he should just be a villain, just be a villain. I was like, no, 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 you got it all wrong. <laughs> Yeah, for me, because, yeah, for me, I, I would definitely consider myself a Gen 2 because I wasn't allowed to read Spider-Man when Amazing 300 came out. So I, I, I never had the opportunity to be a, a Venom fan at the start. But I got into Venom around the time of Maximum Carnage, which was leading up to that those miniseries. So I would still kind of say I was at the tail end of G1, but really, because that's a story where Venom's kind of the anti-hero, I feel like I'm a Gen 2 Venom fan for sure. Yeah. Um. And uh, Venom, th I would say Venom third generation would probably start around Spectacular Spider-Man The Hunger uh, because that came out maybe a year or so before the, the th Spider-Man 3 movie and I would group all those people into Gen 3 Venom fans. Yes. Um, and I would say Le that carries us all that carries us through Flash Thompson, Anti-Venom, all that stuff. Um, and then maybe Gen 4 is where the current movie came out. I would call this Gen 4 Venom fans. I even I the whole Flash thing because there's people that like you know they love Flash and while I like you know those story I, those stories were great <laughs> and uh, which was hard for me to admit at first because I was so I was so mad that it wasn't Eddie <laughs> in the suit but yeah those I, I really enjoyed Flash's time as Venom but yeah that's like a, almost a whole another 
I don't almost break that because there's people that like, well, you know, we want flashback, and you know, I don't go good on them, and, and they should. They, I hate you know killing killing characters. It's it's so passe. You know, it's I, I just well, slot just wanted something big to happen in his last his last issue, but yeah. Yeah, well, how, so be, being as someone who was converted by the story of, like, you know, being kind of iffy on the Flash idea and then being converted, were you upset? Like, it sounds like you were upset So when when Dan Slott killed him. Yeah, well, I mean, my history with Dan Slott goes way back because it's, it's, he's so uh, uh, polarizing because, like, he has, like, some of my very favorite Eddie Brock uh, in like new ways, the new ways to live, uh, that or die, yeah. and then yeah, the, the mini was the new ways to live at. But yeah, like that was that was like penultimate Eddie Brock, like the absolute character growth. Like it showed him grow, and you don't see that very often in, anymore. Now it's like they just do some kind of plot loophole or retcon the to, to try to advance stories. But Dan actually grew Eddie into what you know he was striving to be and it was awesome and and then you know he he was on spider spider-man for way too long because then yeah he's just killing people bringing people back putting carnage on uh norman i yeah he but yeah that that part his run right after you know his superior run uh, superior spider-man was amazing and then uh his his time with the new ways new ways to die was just it was great uh, that whole time in that and comics was really good uh, that was like you know right around Civil War and uh, Secret Invasion that was like the last real good heyday it's kind of been downhill <laughs> since like after Secret Invasion yeah it really has and yeah Dan Slott like and I I agree with you actually I'm I'm very He's done. He actually, I liked a, a lot of his Spider-Man stuff. Not all of it, obviously, but I did like a lot of it, and I really did love um, that that Venom anti-Venom story, new new ways to die. Because, like you said, like I was afraid Venom was dead. I thought Eddie was dead um, up until that book. I thought Eddie cut his wrists in the hospital and, and bled out and died. Um, so I was pretty sure we were never going to see Eddie again. And then it was like, oh great, he's alive, and he's like active in a community he's working with to help homeless people i'm like what a perfect thing for eddie brock to do and then when they get mr negative and involve evolve him into anti-venom I, they, even then i was like god this is so great so now he literally has the power to cure people and like eddie brock uh he's gonna take it a little too far um and it, it was great yeah man dan, dan slot really put a really solid stamp on a lot of stuff but i agree i think 10 years on a character is like that's like having four uh like th- that's like a president having four terms it's like all right man we got like after six years we got to cut you off man yeah yeah that's it it's some of the best stuff and and yeah his his whole time is anti I mean, he was a little overpowered <laughs> at first but when they they kind of like dulled it down for that new ways that new ways to live series is, is great too oh yeah um and I mean, yeah that, that's like that, that's like penultimate eddie and then you know now that they're deconstructing him or whatever and <laughs> yeah I would, I would say that's a that's a good segue and so into like current stuff and we'll, we'll go back and forth to other stuff but I do. Um, I've had different people on here. You know, some people tell me they love the, the, um, you know, what Donny Cates is doing. Some people who aren't a big fan. I think, like for me, you know, obviously everyone hears my reviews of the the stuff. I'm I'm kind of fifty fifty. I feel like there's some good concepts, but I feel like some bad executions. And I, I'm not against Eddie having a son, for example, because I feel like that is a way to evolve the character. But then when you make the son like a you know a plot device who could do anything and solve any problem, um, it's it's I don't know. It, it feels like, it feels like okay. There's actually not a lot of thought put into this. It's just uh, this. This is just a way to do shortcuts and get to certain story beats faster or slower, depending on what you you know want to do for you know filling time or whatever. So what? How? Because obviously we, you and I united. We made that video together. Where again, it wasn't to cut Donnie down in any way. It was actually just to be like, hey, look, isn't this cool? The and you said it best actually. I, when you said it, I was like, that's the best summary of what we're doing, which is. Hey, if you guys haven't read these old stories, this is a good way for us to talk about them while still mentioning current Venom stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I Dylan. At first, I was I was kind of a, I was like, oh, all right, all right, cool. I, the, 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 the thing I liked about him is that there was like no supporting cast in that book. 
in which the, the strength of so many books is the supporting cast not having everything be you know you need to have some kind of relatable things <laughs> to you know be able to kind of re- try to relate with somebody who has a freaking alien on is is not uh, something that you know <laughs> you can practically do <laughs> so having like human connections and talking like with even with his dad his dad you know the total POS father that was smacking his kid around and was bad to Eddie like, yeah. that's still a good character to have because there could be tension there could be you know growth and then then it's like kind of all right, Dylan is not really a supporting character. Dylan is a, yeah, like you said, a plot device that super uber powerful yet helpless at the same time. And that's that's kind of my frustrating part with it is I, I just want him to be a supporting character, not a, not a, uh, what is it, the, <laughs> the MacGuffin or the... <laughs> you know. Right, the, the way out. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's like, oh, I'm in this corner now. Hello, Dylan. Right. Um... Yeah, and you know, it's funny you say that because supporting characters are good, and you just gave me that idea. Like, you know what would have been really cool in this book is if Donny Cates really did make the theme of this book family, and he had Eddie Brock's sister play a part in it somehow. He had um, Carl Brock, his father, um, play a bigger part. Because think about that. Dylan, has Dylan never shown any sign that he has special abilities ever in front of Carl? Or is that the reason Carl was hitting him? was because Dylan was turning into a monster in his sleep and Carl didn't know how to deal with it so he kept Dylan inside and and beat him try to beat the evil out of him or something like a like a like a hardcore catholic dad or something it's like you could have had that be a theme and it still happened you could have Dylan having nightmares of Carl hitting him and calling him these names and then have and mix in with the visions of Noel and Noel could be calling out to Dylan and saying like that's how humans will treat you. That's how Eddie will treat you when he finds out who you are. He's going to hit you just like Carl did, and he can manipulate Dylan that way to try to get Dylan. So there's there's all the elements are there to tell this great story with a great supporting cast, and you could have done it in a way that Eddie's never been in before. Eddie's never been in a book about family before. So this would have been a really cool way to explore his personal life with his sister and maybe she has a husband so there's like an extension of uh, supporting cast there you could still keep Alchemex in there if you wanted there's all these things they could have done and instead it's it's really all about the 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 very hollow world building that is happening yeah that's it yeah i wanted to see that jenna the junkie from the new ways to live come back too <laughs> sure or yeah, or agent any, smith or anyone <laughs> the homeless yeah, or, pe- or, the homeless or people Anne, and I, yeah i'm sure and will probably pop back up at, yeah uh, i mean at, at he, some point he keeps yeah. mentioning her and then and then it, then he for, it's like at the beginning of absolute carnage like Anne's in that pile and then it's like oh and then someone says oh Anne's not in that pile and it's like uh, okay, and then they just don't don't mention it for twelve, fifteen issues. Yeah, and the the whole thing with Dylan with his powers, I don't, you know, he might even be a mutant technically, technically Marvel wise. So I maybe his powers hadn't manifested when he was a kid. That'd be a whole another. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. He could just be a mutant. Right. Um, yeah, that's because it's possible. I guess never thought of it uh, as an X Men fan. Never crossed my mind. It's maybe it's because the X Men don't act like X Men anymore. Um, yeah, I, I can't read. I tried reading the <laughs> the House of X and Power. I just got started. I'm like, it felt like '90s '90s word bubbles all over again. I'm like, oh, I just want to look at the pretty pictures, and <laughs> I just flipped through it, and I was like, yeah, not for me still. <laughs> do you do you feel that way? I saw Rick Remender um, since we were talking about Agent Flash and stuff. I saw yeah. Rick Remender p- tweeted yesterday uh, this great tweet, which has been something I've been saying probably for like eight years, ever since my the end of my first year, full full first full year in comics. I noticed that a lot of stories that were being pitched to me were essentially screenplays that were retrofitted to be comic books, and and to me that leads to scenes like what I always criticize Donny Cates for, which is like two people sitting in a chair for eight pages talking to each other. It's like. That kind of tension and stuff is great on screen when actors who are great at their jobs can deliver that tension and the, you have the music and you have every element that makes a movie help build the drama and the tension. And so you'll sit there for eight minutes on a movie and watch two people talk if it's really nail-biting and, and intense. And I think a lot of these guys think that's 
the same thing in comics, and it's like it's really not. And so I'm kind of curious with since we mentioned Hickman and we talk about Cates and we we have similar criticisms of them. What are some of like even if you want to make a few blanket statements, we can dive into them. What are some of yeah. your criticisms of current writing that you just aren't a fan of? Yeah, it's well, it what it really feels like with especially like with. Donnie and Hickman. Well, and I know Hickman has been he's been uh, tabbed for to basically to do stuff to write for to eventually be adapted on screen right. with some of his other runs. But yeah, it feels like sometimes that they're just they're trying to write a story to get put on screen, and it's like writes make let those let those guys worry about it. And I, I've heard him talking about it too. It's about you know how they been dabbling and you know getting stuff made and put on film and i'm like don't write it that way <laughs> don't write a book to get put on screen that let the guys in hollywood <laughs> worry about adapting it and then you know, it's yeah it's extremely frustrating i do not need to see another page of eddie's face talking and re-explaining something that i read two or three issues ago it is it is beyond frustrating i was like it's not fun to read there isn't any tension we already know what happened i mean it's yeah it's it, it, i don't know I, I don't know what what else you do but it, yeah that that drives that drives me insane i, I just want to flip right past those pages <laughs> Yeah, because it, it just doesn't read the same. And, it be, and like I said, it's because it's missing elements. It's missing acting. Yeah. It's missing uh, music. It's missing, you know, camera movement. Um, so it's missing all the all the features. But also, like, it, it's funny, too, because I'll, I'll see people um, all the time, like, you know, debating different stories online and stuff and what they like about it. Now, granted, you know, of course, these are just our opinions. And other people may actually feel the tension. May, they may actually be able to insert themselves so well into the scene that they can imagine all that other stuff. But again, you're you're doing the work for the creator, and that's not what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and then also when you say adapt, you know, like, oh, let Hollywood deal with the adaptation. A hundred percent, because a comic book writer, let's say a freelancer, I've known some to make as less at, as little as $10 a page, um, you know, for, for a comic book or a flat rate of like a couple hundred bucks. Um, sometimes more, but I'm just saying like, just I've worked a lot in indie comics. Um, so I don't know if Marvel pays more than that or whatever, but so you're not getting paid a ton. Let's say you make a thousand dollars to write a comic book, um, and then the artist makes you know a couple thousand drawing it. Uh, Hollywood is going to pay a writer tens of thousands of dollars to to adapt it. So why why make their job in adapting easier? And especially when most of those writers aren't going to do direct adaptations anyway. They're going to have to change things and reformat things anyway. So you're really not helping jack shit. So just tell your story the way you feel is the best way to tell it and use the medium. That's the thing I always critique uh, writers for nowadays is you get a great, they get great artists, Hickman, Cates, uh, Tom King, all these guys who I'm not a big fan of their writing get amazing artists that really are the only reason to pick up the books is for the art. And they still don't know how to write to their artist's strengths. And it's frustrating. And even some of them have great relationships with their artists. And I still feel like there's no way your artist agreed to draw the most boring thing for five pages. I just can't wrap my head around that. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. The, like it's, it's just, it's, I mean, maybe I, it's easier to copy and paste <laughs> <laughs> with the digital drawing now, but yeah, it just, uh, it, it's it's just it's it's rough and it it really feels like you know with the, the the cost is getting jacked up and every month I'm just looking at my comic bill and uh, why am I doing this sometimes <laughs> and, sure. and I, I want to just and I want to flip through and enjoy it. and you know I not every story should be for me I'm not I don't think about it like that but but yeah and I remember a time thinking I was like man I wish you know Venom would be in this I wish Venom would be in that and. You know, now I've gotten to the point. I feel like you know, I the grass is always greener. It's like I really just want him to tell stories were grounded. You know, grounded. That's the best part about Venom. He's yeah, he's got space connections and outer world stuff, but he, he's like the most grounded cosmic character <laughs> that <laughs> that Marvel has. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's he's you know, Daredevil with an alien on him. Um, yeah. 
And that's the thing, though, too, is uh, and to your point, is like, yeah, am I upset that I'm not enjoying every issue of Venom or X-Men? Yeah, sure. But all that does really to me is it just makes me take a time out from those characters. And then I just go put my money towards other things. So like like right now Mar- for Marvel, you know, I'm kind of digging what they're doing with Ghost Rider. Um, I like uh, Morbius. Uh, the Doctor Doom do- uh, book is pretty good. And um, that screen book is not so bad, actually. So it, although it's digital only now, which is frustrating, but um, yeah, I mean, there's there's some still some good like Daredevil to me is is the best book at Marvel, and that's a character I always loved, but I've been in and out of runs on his because of you know where certain writers take him. But what Chip Zdarsky is doing is amazing. So am I bummed I'm missing out on Venom, uh, you know, a little bit or X Men? Uh, I mean, Venom I'm still kind of sticking with on a in an insulary level, but X Men I kind of dropped. Am I bummed about that? Sure. But in its place, I get to read an awesome Daredevil book, which is great. Yeah, that, that whole X-Men thing, it seems like since, I mean, shoot, since the 90s, they seem like way more involved. It's like, because now, like, I think, I'm pretty sure Marvel's got it pretty well divided up. And it's like the X-Men are pretty much insulated from, and if you're not reading all those books, I mean, the Avengers, and Spider-Man, all of them, it's like a whole other world. And it, I, it's almost like reading Marvel to DC and occasionally you get the occasional crossover. And it, I, I can't even begin to get involved with the X books because I'm all tied up on all the spider books right now. And I might occasionally pick up the Avengers, but I mean, I pretty much just stick to the spider books anymore. And then yeah, every now and then I'll pick up like an event one, but I'm not even doing this empire one that's coming out. I, I, I don't even care. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny. I'm a Hulkling fan because I like the the original Young Avengers book, but I do not care about that event either. Um, yeah. I do. Uh, you know, it's funny when people when I worked in comics, everyone would be like, uh, you know, I I always pitched miniseries. I was never an ongoing book guy ever. Um, I would be I'm like, oh yeah, I have like one or two Batman stories. I have one Superman story. Um, you know, I have one Green Lantern story or whatever. Like I would just talk, I would just like, oh, wh- what would you pitch us? And I would just pitch one story and they're like, oh, just the one. I'm like, well, I'm kind of a mini series or graphic novel, guy, like direct to graphic novel guy. I'm not really like a an omnibus writer. Uh, the only exception would be X-Men. <laughs> I actually talked to someone about X-Men once and I literally told them like a seven year plan I had. And they were like, Jeez, and I'm like, yeah, but it's like <laughs> that I could deviate from that plan at any time. I'm just saying I have seven years worth of ideas. Not that they all connect, but I could write the book continuously for seven years. Um, I said, or longer, but you would have to kill me to get off the book. Uh, so, so, but that's that's how I feel about the X Men. So when I don't read them, I'm very bummed. But I will always go try to find a good replacement. So instead of sitting around and kind of whining about it all the time. Um, you know, I try to just be like, all right, well, then now's your time to go read a character who you haven't read in a while. Yeah, yeah, that, it is. It's fun. I, I find it real hard, though, to try to get into something new anymore. But just with, like, how much the stuff costs anymore, you know, I, I'm not, like, living in a poorhouse or nothing, but <laughs> it's, they're not making it easier to jump on new titles. It's true. And, to kind of backtrack a little bit from there to to Venom and stuff, because one thing I like about you too is that you have a really interesting collection and a very specific interest in what you buy. Like, uh, for example, right before we started the show, uh, actually, Eddie, uh, I was on the phone with him, and we I didn't record yet, and he goes, uh, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for this book called, uh, what was it called? The, the Dark Book. <laughs> right. It was called The Dark Book. It's a wizard magazine bonus magazine that came with a, one of the issues of wizard and it has carnage on the cover and i think it's just a a book that tells you about a lot of the villains in the marvel universe we don't really know what it is but we both went on ebay to buy one <laughs> before the show started so what so what is it about things like that that you that you have to have for your like are you that kind you're a completionist where because you're you mentioned earlier about night thrasher's first issue are you a first appearance collector like are you on that level do you try to get the best version or would you settle for an, a bad version of the book like if it's being dinged up just so you have it and then you can improve it you know buy a better version later like kind of what's your thought process in collecting and why is venom such a big you know part of that collection I'm a, I'm a total sucker for the stuff from the '90s. Okay. <laughs> good, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, they all, you know, they're they're eye candy. You know, or either way for me. Um, 
Yeah, like I will, I will practically buy about anything Venom. Uh, <laughs> it, you know, for what it's worth. And then, and I really, I have a lot of fun uh, <laughs> pushing my uh, kids sugar in. I'll go to like antique malls, and I love digging through through old back issues and just finding finding like I like finding stuff the like, good deals you know I like I don't I found like some like the first Lobo I found that for like a buck you know I, I love finding the stuff <laughs> that's like good for for cheap I just I get a thrill out of that it's not like like scratch up a lotto ticket or something <laughs> nice then was it you that I did I send you books before yeah you did because like a lot of the, the 90s books man they're they're not they they printed a ton of them but you know the guys on ebay they know that you cannot find many of these series in good shape they're beat and, you know if you if you try to find them online almost always destroyed and yeah yeah i said something in one of the comments about and you did like a bunch of little, little weird venom I mean, he's just a man. I've been hunting for that, and then yeah, you're like, oh, I'll just send them to you. It's like, what, really? <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I to me, it's um, you know, this stuff is it's an investment. I buy things pretty much just to talk about on the show, I, and and sometimes I just don't care to own them afterwards. I'm like, because to me, the the memory of it is the the episode. So like I've 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 you know I do collect statues and toys and stuff, but I'll be honest with you, m- most of that is just so I have a backdrop when I record my show. So it's like a it's like building a set, and these are things that I'll probably write off on my taxes. Um, so to me, I'm just like no, it's an investment for me. It's like I I just want to make sure I cover everything Venom. But yeah, once I do the episode, I'm just like, y- you wrote me at the right time. I saw your comment, and I'm like, he man, he just because it what was it? it was the Dark Hawk issues, the Silver Sable issues. Um, it was just all those random appearances Venom made in the 90s that we did versus episodes on. And you were just like, yeah, I could really use, I'm just looking for some of those, you know, can you point me in the right direction? I said, dude, just give me your address. I'll just send them all to you. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't mind. Like I, I, it was, you're, like I said, you're a big contributor to the show and I'm grateful. And so it was, it was, um, I was happy to help out and it was nice to know that I was giving them really what I care about is giving stuff to a good home. Uh, that's all I really want to, because I don't want to give something to someone who's not going to take care of it in the way I would. Even if I don't care to own it anymore, I'll still take very good care of it because my hope is to one day give it to someone who will take care of it. So do you, are you that type too, like with your collection? Do you, have you traded or, or sent stuff off to people who were like needing help to find something? You know, and there is stuff in here that I, that I have. I got, jeez, I don't even know. What am I looking at here? One, two, three, four, five. I got, I got about a, 10 10 long boxes and <laughs> about a dozen uh short boxes so i there is plenty of stuff i'm not attached to and uh you know if anybody was looking for something if i even if i had doubles or something i i i'm all about it you know uh you know a friend or whatever <laughs> or someone who appreciates it that, that's my thing it's like if someone wanted if someone appreciated it and i had an extra one or i didn't want it or whatever I'd, I'd be rid of it in a heart because I got way too many as it is. Ask my wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that was a thing too when you were uh, when you messaging me. You're like, yeah, um, I'm gonna let my wife know that I got, like I don't I don't have to spend any money on these comics. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, no problem. Like, <laughs> um, that's cool. So so um, it's you know being someone who's like you said, anything Venom, you're like I gotta have it. I gotta collect it. Obviously, I'm gonna guess Eddie Brock is your favorite version of Venom, and uh, and since you kind of came in in G1, but you kind of like Venom being an antihero, so you're kind of a G twoer. You know, what are some of your favorite things in your collection that involve Venom, and uh, and and what are some of your favorite things about the character in general? Well, I mean, I, you know, I got Secret Wars, I even I got the 252. Actually, uh, that's one of my favorite stories as a kid is my comic shop that's like the first book I hunted that like when I was a kid I was uh, man I had been like maybe eight or something my dad took me to the store and I was like I want I want to get the first time you know the symbiote appeared and and he took me to the comic shop and you know the guy pulled out you know amazing 252 and I bought it um, back then for like I don't know like six seven bucks and and I've had it ever since. I, I still got so many of my issues from when I was a kid that I'm just I'm glad that I took care of the stuff. They're not like, some of them aren't, I mean, like that one's not like a 9, 8 or whatever graded, but they got, like I have my original 316 and 17 that are just beat 
they're just beat to all hell. <laughs> but I love them, and you know, and I got those two displayed, and I got my other stuff, you know, hidden away. Um, uh, I got, you know, my, my like I love my lethal protector. I got a lethal protector that's signed by Stan Lee. That I, I got that in a, in a box that, that I bought from a comic shop. It's like a contest type thing. Nice. Um, I got to meet Ron Lim. Ron Lim, like the most underrated comic artist I think ever. Yeah, and that's <laughs> I, he's done a lot of big things too. Oh, uh, he like his Silver Surfer stuff is amazing, yeah. and that that's kind of and I didn't realize it was kind of neat thing with my dad too because like I didn't even realize how much Ron Lim stuff I had, <laughs> and then my dad like absolutely like loves the Silver Surfer, so he's got a ton of it. So I got to go meet him, and got some stuff like signed and sent away. I, like I got like you know Lethal Protector was it five that he did the interiors for and and like an absolute carnage cover he did like yeah ron Lim just kills it and i <laughs> yeah i just wish that he was highlighted more and and was on like an ongoing i'd probably buy it just for his work yeah no no kidding because he recently showed up in venom 150 and then also just recently uh, the donny cates venom 25 as a backup story and when i saw his stuff again it was so nice and they put the little dots on it like pop art style and I'm like, like whoever his colorist is is phenomenal. And I was like, yeah, Ron Lim needs to do like a one-shot Venom book, like an annual, or he needs to do like a, a, a two, three-issue miniseries on Venom. Yeah, I asked him. I said, when are you going to do, when are you going to get on a regular series? You know, he's, he's like, oh, they just want me to do a variant. You know, he does like all, all their variant covers now. He like has a variant for like every book. It's crazy. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he seemed happy doing it. So it was cool. I, I met him and his wife and his kid at uh, Motor City Con up in Detroit. It was, it was it was neat. Yeah, doing cover work is 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 it can be very very good for artists because you're getting paid a cover rate and it's it's pretty usually pretty high and uh, and if you get like three four covers a month you could probably pay your bills for the month. Um, yeah. So it's sometimes it's better to do that, especially when you're getting up there in age. Uh, it's better to do that. But like Lim and Bagley and those guys, I, I feel like they're gonna draw when they're 110. Man, those guys are never gonna stop. Yeah, yeah, they're 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 legends, man. <laughs> Absolutely, and so uh, and so, like I, to reiterate the last question, um, yeah. before we wrap up is, uh, you know, again, Venom himself. Like, what are some of your favorite characteristics of the guy, and and what are, you know, do you have some favorite versions of him? Like, uh, whether it's artist rendition or you know, movie or cartoon, video game. Like, is there anything that stands out to you? Yeah, like the character in general. What I what I've always liked about him is that he's flawed. He's got he's got issues, and he knows it. And I really appreciated how well up until recently he was like he was God fearing. You know, like he knew that he wasn't, you know, the be all and end all. And uh, and I just I yeah, I like that he had problems and he had to deal with it. It was very relatable that he that he did stuff wrong and and he's has to you know deal with it in his own way and that he, i like that he's never really tried to do bad yeah he they had him kill people early on but, you know they they walked away from it and uh but yeah you know, that, that's my favorite part about him is that he's just got he's got problems and relatable stuff you know aside from the alien stuff and the murder <laughs> 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 but uh yeah that and i mean i think aesthetically he's uh, like like I said, that, that's how we caught my eye. I just walked by, like, whoa, look at that guy. He looks, he just looks mean. He looks tough. You know, he, he's he's the the best part of the '90s <laughs> visually, uh, and you know, and he just reminds me of that era. And yeah, I, my favorite runs of him were yeah, it was this, probably the slot stuff, which still blows my mind. That. <laughs> 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 but yeah, his his time as anti venom was like the best Eddie. You know that them two together. Uh, you know, Lethal Protector was good. I liked it. And, uh, and some of the stuff is just like I said. It's just it's just look at it. Don't read it. <laughs> 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 I agree though. It's it's uh, even rereading it now recently, and then rereading Spider Island and stuff, and seeing how integral Vetti, uh, Eddie was to that story and saving New York. I. Man, I was like, what a great arc for that character. I, that Like mm-hmm. him being at the very bottom, uh, just above suicide, working with Aunt May, the woman he was going to attempting to kill before uh, Dan Slott took over, and then being transformed to Anti-Venom and going off on these really only a couple adventures. I mean, he wasn't Anti-Venom. 
he was anti-venom for like maybe three years but he was only in maybe like seven books seven stories yeah like it was yeah it yeah, wasn't he, a lot i think it was only like i mean yeah he was in a couple of spider-man things he did amazing a couple times and then he was in the new ways to live and then that went off in the revengers that those two <laughs> annuals which was bizarre yeah but uh, that and, uh, you know another thing i really let you know help grow is that that 90s cartoon that that 90s eddie brock that cartoon eddie brock was great you know it was really good uh they they did they stayed true to their whole revenge angle and lethal protector and i i loved i love that whole relationship there that that he had and uh hank azaria's voice <laughs> which that, that man that, that the cast and that that show blows my mind looking back at it now it really is. That, that show was something very special, and it introduced a lot of things. I mean, technically, that was the first Spider-Verse uh, in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. They did their own take on the Secret Wars. They brought in Morbius and Blade and all. I mean, they had the X-Men appeared on it. It's like that show is really, like, it, we're, we're, we're spoiled rotten because when I tell people, like, who's your favorite Spider-Man cartoon? I'm like, well, obviously, it's going to be the 90s. Like, I grew up with them, Spider-Man's Amazing Friends, but I never overly loved that show the way I love the 90s show. And nothing that's come out since com- even compares. So I get when people go, oh, why don't you make it more like the 90s show? And it's like, well, you can understand as creators, nobody wants to retread, you know, what the 90s show did. But the 90s show pretty much straight up adapted the comics as accurately as they could and put them on screen. So once they you do that, you take that away for everyone else after you to be able to do that. <laughs> well, I don't know. It, it works in comics. They just redo the same stuff all the time, right? Well, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> what I like cartoons, though, because, like, everyone does try to approach it from a new angle. They're like, all right, I'm not – like, for example, the current cartoon, obviously, Peter is at a high school, like, full of geniuses. And it's like, okay, that's very different from the 90s cartoon. Um so uh, and then like what was the Spider-Man Limited? He was in another universe, and then Spider-Man uh, MTV. He was in college. So, uh, so yeah, it's just like I ever think feel like everyone does kind of their own thing, and it's, and that's fine I, as long as the characters act like the characters. I don't really complain, but uh, still, yeah, Venom best version on that '90s show for yeah. sure. I never understood why they keep trying to make Peter into a kid in the shows because <laughs> yeah. I related to him just as good as a young adult as you know as a kid he had someone to look up to because he always did the right thing you know that that's what I, it blows my mind but i try to make him a kid and i don't know well, maybe they, it's just me being old no they make him a kid and he and he has these very like like 40 year old wise decisions he makes and i'm right. like i'm like okay i know he's smart but come on man like yeah. you know so that's why i think it's so important for me at least that i embrace too not just because i i mean i like the character in general but miles morales what he does to me is he helps age Peter. So there are versions of cartoons where him and Peter are around the same age. In the video game, they did that. But obviously, the Spider Verse movie had a like, you know, almost forty-year-old Peter Parker with a gut. And I'm like, yes, like if so, if Miles gets to be Spider-Man, so we can get older Peter Parker stories, stories, and Miles is the teenager Spider-Man, then that's even more reason for me to love Miles because it helps progress Peter as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, dude, man, as always, it's a pleasure talking to you. I know um, pretty soon you're going to be, uh, you know, being deployed out. Uh, for those who don't know, you know, our friend Eddie here is in the military. So, first of all, man, or, you know, first of all, we're at the end of the episode, but thank you for your service. I al- always appreciate it. And I, I appreciate our phone calls and our talks. And I'm definitely going to miss you while you're away. Hopefully, there will still be ways where we can stay in touch. And uh, even though I won't be on Twitter and social media, like, you know, you have my number. It's there if you ever need it. And if I ever hear from Donnie again, we'll try to sync up to where we can have you on the show. But if not, I'll be happy to ask him your questions for you as well. Yeah, man. Thank you very much. And, of course, yeah, thanks for thanks for doing these these uh, podcasts. It's cool. I like I like hearing all the people's stories. It's neat. And seeing uh, what's, what's different between uh, all the fans and, just learning about people it's neat well i i have a surprise that i'll spring on you here because you didn't know about this and uh to give people something to look forward to i still have three or four more episodes i got to edit and put up before this one goes up so this might go up the week you're deployed um but i'll I'll try to get it up sooner so you can at least hear it um but uh but i'm i am gonna have uh, an actor from the first venom movie on an upcoming parasite podcast um and uh, also, I'm going to have uh, a couple other creative people that'll be on the podcast. That, that they're content creators, but they're like, uh, you know, 
famous and working on projects and stuff. So the Parasite podcast will have people from the comment section, but it'll also I'll balance it out with uh, people in the industry too. So there's a lot of fun stuff coming up on the show, and I can't thank you and everyone out there for inspiring me to do this. I'm so glad I am. And after I get through those big interviews, uh, probably in August, I'll start reaching back into the comments and finding more people uh, to, to do uh, interviews for. So that way you have stuff to listen to while you're you know deployed out and stuff. That's awesome. You're going big time. Look at you. <laughs> yes. And it's thanks to all of you guys. So, uh, yes, make sure you stay subscribed. And make sure you go check out on Twitter, Eddie's Mullet. I'll put his link uh, down below so you can go follow him on there. And, uh, and you know, check him out. He's always in our comment section. And so feel free to reply to anything he posts. You know, have a great you know, debate, discussion, whatever you want to do. Do it peacefully in the comment section. And, uh, and, yeah, and everyone in the comments listening to this episode, wish Eddie luck and have him, you know, wish him a safe return. And hopefully we'll have him back on the show very soon. Eddie, say something. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was your outro. All right. Thank you, man. Thank you. Take care of everybody. Uh, yes. <laughs> see you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and we'll see you in the future. Peace. <laughs>